Welcome to uh, uh, Ex Libris. We're very pleased this evening to have with us uh, Kevin Prufer. Uh, Kevin is uh, the author of five books of poetry. Uh, the latest is Churches. Um, he is uh, on, the, on the, the faculty of the University of Houston. Uh, creative writing program, and we're here to talk about Stevie Smith. Um, Kevin, do you want to tell us why we want to talk about Stevie Smith? Why we want to talk about Stevie Smith? <laughs> um, I, I have found, uh, I've always found Stevie Smith to be sort of an intriguing poet, and um, and the reason, uh, it's such a weird format for me, speaking alone in a room to a computer, so I'm, I'm doing my best with it. Um, <laughs> I've, I've always, uh, I've, I've found her interesting maybe for two reasons. And, um, light? Huh? I need light. Okay. I can't see anything. Yeah. Yeah. They'll yeah. Huh? Keep going on. Okay. Keep going. Okay. Um, one, one of those reasons is that, that she accomplishes something that, that, um, that interests me musically. Uh, I, I, I always like to imagine that, um, I mean, this is a, a simplification, but that there are two kinds of, of, way, uh, of ways in which uh, a Stevie Smith poem is communicating meaning. And one of those, one of those ways is through the sort of summarizable, easily sort of summarizable uh, uh, meanings of, of her words. And the other is um, often working in counterpoint to that sort of surface meaning, which is the, um, the the ideas and feelings that are expressed through her manipulation of um, rhythms and and her sort of constantly shifting uh, sort of metrical sensibility, and that often uh, these two meanings are not working hand in hand, um, which I guess is another way of saying that what. What I, I find most interesting, Stevie Smith, is a kind of ambivalence that I see at work. Um, an, an ambivalence in which the music of the poem seems to suggest one thing, while the speaker of the poem is telling us quite a different thing. And sometimes that ambivalence uh, is spiritual in nature, and sometimes the ambivalence is, um, I mean, in the poems that I selected, has to do with um, mortality, and obviously those two those two overlap quite a lot. Um, she wrote plenty of poems about death. Yeah, she did. <laughs> I mean, you know, what else is there to talk about, right? Um, and, you know, maybe I can get into it sideways, actually. Can I get into it kind of sideways? Is that all right? And sure. Do you, want to, do you want to read a poem, and then we can all get into it sideways with you? Sure, or I could get into it sideways with another poem that she didn't write. Okay. And that, that, that's, that's, that's fine. Okay. Simpler. Um, well, it's not a simple poem. Do you know that poem on Anne Bradstreet's poem on the death of her granddaughter? Do you know that poem? Yes. Um, were you at the Were you at the Young Center? I, I, I'm everywhere, Kevin. Uh, you are everywhere. Oh my God, you're omnipresent. You're even on the screen of my computer. It's so weird. Um, Don't let it worry you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I've recently been spending a lot of time looking at a poem by Anne Bradstreet on the death of her grandchild. And I could probably read it to you if I can call it up on my screen. Um, hang on one second. It's just slowly coming up. Um, okay, well, while that's going on, uh, uh, can, can you hear us, Patty? Yes. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, <laughs> Patty. Hi, Kevin. It's been a long time. It's been forever. I, th I thought maybe you forgot me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't forgotten you or our workshop. Oh, my goodness. Oh, that was a crazy workshop. <laughs> it certainly was. Anyway, I'm here, and I'm ready and looking forward to the hour. Oh, good. You see, now I'm really intimidated because you're here. Um, um, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to read a poem by Anne Bradstreet first and, and, and talk about that as a way of getting into um, C.B. Smith. It's called In Memory of My Dear Grandchild Elizabeth Bradstreet, who deceased August 1665, being a year and a half old. 
which is a, which is a really long and unwieldy title for an incredibly elegant and graceful poem that was written also in 1665, which is to say not that long after the death of her grandchild. Um, and here's how it goes. Are you still there? I'm here. Oh, good. All my vice screen just went blank. Farewell, dear babe, my heart's too much content. Farewell, sweet babe, the pleasure of mine eye. Farewell, fair flower that for a space was lent, then taken away unto eternity. Blessed babe, why should I once bewail thy fate or sigh thy days so soon were terminate, since thou art settled in an everlasting state? By nature, trees do rot when they are grown, and plums and apples thoroughly ripe do fall, and corn and grass are in their season mown, and time brings down what is both strong and tall. But plants new set to be eradicate, and buds new blown to have so short a date, is by his hand alone that guides nature and fate. And I, I, when I read this poem, um, I see I see Stevie Smith echoes of it in Stevie Smith. Um, it's first of all obviously a poem that deals with mortality, um, with nature, and with the divine. Um, but it's also a poem that, like Stevie Smith's poems, is its primary work. I feel is to express a thinking mind that is to suggest to us a mind in motion on a problem that that mind isn't really capable of um, solving or even fully understanding. And um, the poem begins by suggesting to us that the grandmother is saying goodbye to her grandchild that she loved too much. Um, she says that the grandchild is her heart's too much content, which seems like an odd thing to say in a poem. Um, I think maybe a more contemporary worship would imagine that uh, it's impossible to love to love a grandchild too much, but that seems to be what Anne Bradstreet is saying. Um, perhaps it's because um, looking at the divine, Anne Bradstreet um, is of the belief that everything that God does, He does for um, as part of a larger plan, and that larger plan is ultimately for the good. Um, she asks a question in the first stanza. It, it, the, the, the poem is divided into two seven-line stanzas. And her question is, why should I be sad that you're gone since you're in a better place than I am? Um, she says, why should I be sad since thou art settled in an everlasting state? And I think by implication, Bradstreet is saying that she's stuck here in this world. And it's a world that I think we're supposed to imagine resembles somewhat the world of pretty in the Stevie Smith poem, where Stevie Smith looks out at the landscape and finds it to be increasingly um, increasingly disturbing. Um, she answers her question in the second stanza, um, her question, why am I sad that you're gone if you're in a better place and everything God does, he does for the best, and is my sadness maybe um, Maybe, if not, a sin may be the cousin of a sin, since it's a sadness at something that God has done. Um, and her answer is messed up. Um, the first uh, five lines of her seven-line answer are completely inappropriate. She says, well, trees rot when they're grown, and plums and apples fall when they're ripe, and corn and grass are mown down when they're mature, and time brings down what is both strong and tall, which is a terrible answer to her question about why God would take her granddaughter. Um, so she shifts gears, <laughs> um, not finding satisfaction in that answer, and finds satisfaction in this answer. But plants new set to be eradicate, and buds new blown to have so short a date, is by his hand alone that guides nature and fate. But of course, this answer isn't satisfying either. Um, the initial images of God as a farmer who eradicates are um, properly uh, matured, which isn't a very satisfying view of God. So she backs off on that one and says maybe he's like an orchard keeper. But if he's like an orchard keeper, he's an orchard keeper who cuts the buds off the trees before they turn into fruit. And that's not a satisfying answer. So she finally lands on the best answer she can give us, which is, is by his hand alone that guides nature and fate. And this is a trick that I also see happening in Stevie Smith a lot, which is to say, 
So she ultimately tell, she ultimately comes to a truth, but it's a totally unsatisfying truth. It's not satisfying to say, well, it's not for me to decide, it's for you to decide. And you can hear that dissatisfaction in the music of the line, a poem that has been really entirely iambic pentameter with small, very small variations, lands on a 12-syllable line, um, is by his hand alone that guides nature and fate. And it's here that I see the music of the poem diverging from the stated meaning of the poem, where um, stated meaning is, it's not my decision, that's just how things work. And the music of the poem comes haltingly as if this is a very hard thing to say or a troubling thing to say. And it's there that I find the power of the poem. And that's a power that back when I was in graduate school, when I first came across T.B. Smith, geez, that might have been in your class, Patty Ann, I don't know. That long, huh? <laughs> <laughs> that long, <isn't> it? <laughs> um, it's, it's what I find in, in Stevie Smith's constantly shifting gears. I mean, Stevie Smith does it much more frequently, almost um, almost obsessively. Um, but but that, that shifting of gears um, suggesting a move, an emotional movement that happens in counterpoint to the stated um, meanings of the poem. I mean, I think maybe I should read a Stevie Smith. I could read the old chestnut that we all know, and maybe we could talk about that. Is that okay, Don? That's fine, sure. Okay. Um, the old chestnut, Waving but Drowning, which is sadly the only poem she's known for, um, I think. Um, not Waving but Drowning. Nobody heard him, the dead man, but still he lay moaning. I was much farther out than you thought and not waving, but drowning. Poor chap, he always loved larking, and now he's dead. It must have been too cold for him, his heart gave way, they said. Oh, no, 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 it was too cold always. Still the dead one lay moaning. I was much too far out all my life, and not waving, but drowning. I, I've thought a lot about this poem, and I don't really know what it's about. <laughs> um, it, it begins, I, I've got ideas. It begins in that sort of Dickinsonian universe in which we're not even really sure um, whether what we mean by dead man, it's like that poem that begins, I heard a fly buzz when I died, already from the beginning, sort of destabilizing this, this idea of the speaker who who may be literally dead, speaking from beyond, or who may be talking about a spiritual sort of deadness or an emotional deadness. It's, it's, it's hard to know how to read that. And here that's compiled by the fact that we suspect right away that the speaker of the poem, um, the eye of the poem, and the dead man of the poem, I mean, are, are one. And the person telling us this poem, too, is identifying um, with both of these. So it, it becomes a confusing sort of triple identification that happens there. Um, I know it's based on, it's based on a newspaper article, I think, right, um, uh, about, or based on, sort of, well, was sparked by a newspaper article in which, um, that Stevie Smith read about, in which the speaker, uh, a bunch of people on a beach see somebody drowning, and she's flailing her arms around, and they all just wave back, and the speaker, <laughs> And the speaker, uh, and, and the and the and the woman then ends up drowning. Um, but you know what I'm so interested in is is the way the the meter changes really dramatically in the second stanza when um, we overhear you know when the when the speaker of the poem is recollecting what the people on the beach might have been saying, and we hear there suddenly the the meter turn dramatically sort of chipper. For chap, he always loved larking. And now he's dead. It must have been too cold for him. His heart gave way. They said, <laughs> where the even-numbered lines, I think, sort of suggest the the sort of finality and and despair of the actual speaker of the poem, and the odd-numbered lines suggest the sort of upbeat, sort of chipperness that he imagines in a world that, or that she imagines in a world that excludes her, right, <laughs> or that somehow that somehow led to her death. It's that that kind of movement that I find really um, really exciting and interesting in this poem. Let's see. Does anyone else have a reaction to this poem? 
Well, certainly. I love the way that the uh, slant rhyme is so rich in this, and and also the fact that certainly if he was dead, he wouldn't be moaning. Mm -hmm. So that there's, you know, there, there's a sort of a nursery rhyme nonsense about it. So that even as it's handling, you know, the issue of not only someone else's death, but I think it's really very much about the speaker's death or anybody reading it. It becomes very personalized by the end of it. And you know, this would be very scary and serious. And it's being handled in, in, in a way which is, uh, you know, almost a, a kid's rhyme. Yeah. The slant okay. rhyme is odd, though, too. I think the slant rhyme make, makes the poem a little bit... I always feel like slant rhyme, you know, in Dickinson, too, I always want to sort of bump this poem up against Dickinson's poems because they both make use of sort of alternating slant rhyme and, and, and you know, proper rhyme dead and said here. Where where the where the slant rhyme is a little bit disturbing, as if things are almost coming together but aren't quite, <laughs> right? <laughs> and the, the perfect rhyme is even more disturbing um, because it, it comes when we don't expect it. You know, we're expecting a, a longer line, but the perfect that line they said is is so final. It's as though we expect that line to keep speaking, and it and it doesn't. And it makes the poem kind of funny, but it also suggests maybe the the sort of cut off shortness of death. I think it's also uh, typical of a lot of misdirection mm -hmm. uh, that that in, in a lot of her poems where she's deliberately not telling you exactly what she wants you to know, and mm -hmm. and there's a, that sense that she knows what she's talking about, but she wants you to have a, a sense that she knows what she's talking about and you don't know what she's talking about. And and there's this kind of almost passive-aggressive interplay with the reader where reading Patty, or, uh, Stevie Smith poems, a, a lot of times I had the feeling she didn't like me much. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, that they, you know, that they were poems that were there vaguely, you know, not, not me personally, but as the readers, the readers she was writing to, that, that, that she wasn't very fond of them, and, and she wanted to tell them things they needed to know, uh, but not directly. She would just sort of and, and have this kind of pretense of uh, almost being direct, almost saying what she was. Although, you know, the later poems uh, in the Scorpion book, she's, she's very direct and says, you know, this, 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 this is what the, that was. But but before, there, there was that strange uh, persona she would, she would inhabit. Or, or maybe when it, you say, like, there's a tension in the poems, like, I, poems have, you know, po poems like Stevie Smith have a sort of tension. The tension is between the smile that she's wearing on her face and the grimness of what she is saying, that, that sort of grinning skull-ishness. <laughs> yeah, and, and she used to read those, uh, if I'm not, not too mistaken, especially earlier in her career, she would she she read them in schoolgirl dresses and and, yeah. and had a costume and and, and, a, and a very uh, elaborate presentation, which was not that un, uncommon in those days. You know, people used to speak poems. You know, that was that was sure. what they did. Think about you just about sit on readings, but I mean, I, I mean, I kind of think that it's more than just a sort of, you know, I mean, I just called it grinning scullishness and kind of laughed at it. But I think there's a real seriousness underneath yeah. that. I, mean, I think she's talking about a human way of responding to pain, and the, the human way of responding to pain is that she's that she's getting at least partly in here is a sort of gritting of the teeth and yeah. and smiling at, at, as if you know what el what else is there to do. I mean, it's not exactly solvable. There so. are two. There are two male poets that I think of that come just a bit before Stevie Smith, that uh, I think were very much in the same thing. So Edward Arlington Robinson, and and of course uh, Hardy. Uh, you know poems like you know Are you digging at my grave? Uh, hmm? no, that, I'm, oh no, nothing. Sorry, I'm off on another poem. Keep going. Sorry. Oh well, I'm I'm just. I'm just saying that, they, and, and as with their poetry, it seems to be the same thing. You know, you have this this terribly fearsome uh, view of the world uh, and a fear of death being uh, being delivered in, in in a very wry, fun sort of way. So I don't yeah, think Stevie was alone in, at the time. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, it's a, It's also, you see it today in Frederick Seidel. I don't know if you like Frederick Seidel's work. Sure. Are you? 
Hello? Hello. Oh. Yeah. Over there. I'll, be, I'll, come, back. I'll come back. Oh, there you are. <laughs> well, I, 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 I kind of like this appear and disappear. You can try it if you like. It's, it's, it's kind of fun. Um, well, tell us when you're going to do it, Dom. When I'm going to come back or when I'm going to go? Away. Both. Okay. I'll stay for a little while. Um, but not many, you know, interestingly, not many poets will flirt with being silly. You know, you know, really very few poets will will come close to, you, you, you know, they may write some humorous verse, but not many will go as, as Stevie Smith often will. She'll just suddenly go into something relatively childish mm -hmm. and then talk about death. And, and uh, she uses a much broader uh, uh, page, I guess, would be one way to put it, of, of, of images that, and and voices that she can bring to to a poem. I think she's only I, I think she's only silly at first, <laughs> and then and then she becomes um, I don't know. There's a sort of a an interesting woundedness I hear in the sort of shifting of shifting of music, as if the mind and the poem is trying to go to, to circling around and around a problem that she can't actually find her way out of, but. Um, I see her as really vulnerable in this particular poem, and it feels like a, a key to other things that she does that may be a little bit more smart-ass, but right here, she's, the last two lines of this poem really feel emblematic to something that might fuel her other work. Mm -hmm. it, but, you know, it, it, it's also kind of interesting that, that she, when she published Not Waving But Drowning, she included the drawing, mm -hmm. which is this sad but strangely childlike drawing. You know, her drawings were were sort of vaguely like would remind us sort of a Thurber or some you know some of these, yeah. these line drawings. But you know, they 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 appear throughout all her poems. These these kind of uh, illustrations. And her drawing is of a woman in this poem, which is interesting, yeah. isn't it? The woman. Yeah, I don't know. Fran, do you have the do you have the PowerPoint there? No, I don't, but what I'm gonna do is make you present her right now and that should take care of it and you can do it. Oh boy, that that has never worked for us before, but well here we go. Hold on <laughs> a minute. I can get that drawing for us. Hold on. Tom, don't do anything. Hold on. I'm going away, Patty. Thank Stay you. Go away. Stay put. Wow, it's a weird control you have over my screen. It's disturbing. <laughs> All right, Dom, you should be set. All right, let's see. Where am I? Oh, here's all my stuff. Oh, oh, I can't Here's. go back. Hold on. Talk amongst yourself while I get to that place again. Are so what about the parenthetical line? Sorry? The parenthetical line, still the dead ones stay, lay moaning. Yeah. yeah why, why, why not put that in a... How much would it have changed the poem if that wasn't in parentheses? I don't know. It comes at you in parentheses as a kind of a whisper, as if to say, lest, lest you have lost track yeah. of the I dead one. I remind you. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm just wondering why this is the poem that she's known for. Um, well, as mo mo you know, most known for, let's say, I guess. Most known poem. I mean, there's someone know. responsible for that. <laughs> I mean, some anthologist or more than one or... I have no idea. I have no idea. I've, I've always wondered that it's, it's what I like, but it's I, I like pretty more. I think pretty is a more interesting poem. I do too. I oh, I think, I think <laughs> all these poems. No, honestly, her poems make people uncomfortable and not waving but drowning is less uncomfortable. And maybe that's why they embraced it. You mean more understandable? Well, I, as I said before, I think she's more vulnerable in there. She's, she's really out there in some of the yeah. other poems. She's yeah. not taking any crap from anybody. And, and she's She's so sharp, people would respect it and kind of then turn away. 
Should we look at, at pretty? Yeah. Let's look at this pretty thing. Yeah. I don't know. Right, let's do that. Is it normal for it or something? What'd you say? Should I read it? Yes. yes. I would like okay. to have it read. Me too. You, uh, you, you want to read it, Patty? Oh, well, I, okay. Nice. Well, okay. Pretty. Why is the word pretty so underrated? In November, the leaf is pretty when it falls. The stream grows deep in the woods after rain. And in the pretty pool, the pike stalks. He stalks his prey, and this is pretty too. The prey escapes with an underwater flash, but not for long. The great fish has him now. The pike is a fish who always has his prey, and this is pretty. The water rat is pretty. His paws are not webbed. He cannot shut his nostrils as the otter can and the beaver. He is torn between the land and water. Not torn, he does not mind. The owl hunts in the evening, and it is pretty. The lake water below him rustles with ice. There is frost coming from the ground. In the air, mist. All this is pretty. It could not be prettier. Yes, it could always be prettier. Wait a minute, I didn't say that right. Yes, it could always be prettier. The eye abashes. It is becoming an eye that cannot see enough. Out of the wood, the eye climbs. This is prettier. A field in the evening tilting up. The field tilts to the sky. Though it is late, the sky is lighter than the hill field. All this looks easy, but really it is extraordinary. Well, it is extraordinary to be so pretty. And it is careless, and that is always pretty. This field, this owl, this pike, this pool are careless, as nature is always careless and indifferent. Who sees, who steps, means nothing, and this is pretty. So a person can come along like a thief, pretty, stealing a look, pinching the sound and feel, lick the icicle broken from the bark, and still say nothing at all, only cry, pretty. Cry, pretty, 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 and you'll be able very soon not even to cry pretty, and so be delivered entirely from humanity. This is prettiest of all. It is very pretty. <laughs> That's a dark call. <laughs> yeah, but why do we laugh? I laugh. You know, we've done all we can do with that word <laughs> and left humanity. <laughs> Yeah, so, I, I I used to think of this, but what if, what, you know, I mean, since it seems to be at least sort of jokingly participating, I mean, Riley participating in that sort of um, romantic nature poem. Yeah. World, but it, you know, but it substitutes the, the implied sort of transcendental word beautiful with the word pretty. <laughs> I, I always think that's an interesting way to think about the, you know, like, like what's the pretty and, and, and how does that, how does it rattle through the poem? I, well, I don't know. I, you know, she's, I kind of see her thinking as she goes through here, you know, well, this is pretty and this is pretty and the death is pretty and the thief is pretty and, and, pre and pretty soon you're, the word me has no meaning. Yeah, or maybe it has the meaning that, um, because even from the beginning, not pretty. I mean, it's it, it begins with in death, right? I mean, in the pretty pool, the pike stalks yeah. the stalks yeah. the prey. It's the the quality of that death hasn't really sunk in for the speaker, and then she never really lets it sink in. I don't think, because she keeps on calling it pretty, which is a way of never going beneath the surface of a thing, like beautiful. That that's quite a different thing from saying you're pretty. I mean, you're pretty is about is about the surface of you. 
and and you know she's constantly confronted in this poem with people with death um death and winter and and um and it seems like part of the exercise of the poem is that is, is at least of the first half of the poem is her trying to convince herself that that's that it's different from what it is well, you know, that's the same as that Bradstreet poem you read. Yeah. You know, she finally comes to the conclusion, well, it has to be pretty because God's doing it. You know, <laughs> she doesn't use the word pretty, but but it's the same thing, right? The only way that she reconciles it, if that's what Stevie Smith is doing, uh, reconciles herself to it is by saying it's pretty. It's pretty. It has to be pretty. God's doing it. Yeah, except Stevie Smith gets so anxious, you know, in the middle of the poem, there, there's this dramatic shift where suddenly, you know, she keeps on saying, oh, well, pretty, 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 you know, even while she's being faced with some stuff that's not pretty, and then says, oh, this is pretty, it could not be prettier, like the volume's been turned up to the point where, I know. you know, and then she stops and says, oh, well, yes, it could always be prettier, I the know. eye of ashes, it is becoming an eye that cannot see enough. Out of the woods the eye climbs. This is prettier field in the evening tilting up. The field tilts to the sky. And suddenly you think like the whole landscape just shifted on her, you know? Uh, yeah. Like Emerson's weird floating eyeball or something like that. <laughs> and, then, um, and then it got turned on its head and she completely lost her balance. And then everything changes in the poem, her, her you know? And then we start talking about carelessness and indifference, which sounds kind of like what she was at the beginning. It sounds like she was being careless at the beginning and, you know, but when you think about the word careless, I think it's, and indifference, I think it's, um, they're more freighted than they appeared to me at first. Like, careless meaning it doesn't care about you. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Know? Yeah. Or it doesn't right. give a shit about you. And indifference that also suggests that, you know, while you're out there, pretty pretty at nature what nature is saying back to you is you don't mean anything at all yeah, well that you know the word she's dismantling pretty she's turning it into can you hear me yeah yes. no, I can't. oh okay sorry she's 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 just driving the word into you until you realize she's not talking about prettiness at all she's talking about something else she's demolished with wonderful spirit i think because pretty has to do with pleasing people. It doesn't have to do with the fierceness and the carelessness of the forces she's writing about. Mm -hmm. well, well, yes, it, it's also a term that's, that's not applied to any of the things, for the most part, that she, she or rat or the, you know, the, the pretty owl, you know, where things we would apply pretty to uh, uh, would be relatively uh, extraneous items, you know, uh, things which the decorations on a cake are pretty. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I lost you. Yeah, it was breaking up for me. Me too. Yeah. Me too. But not too much. We kind of got the sense, I think. <laughs> That's as much as I've got. Go ahead on. <laughs> well, you know how you say a word uh, you've, as a child, or maybe if you've remained a child, you continue to do it. You say a word until suddenly it has no meaning. You know, mm -hmm. you say it and you hear it and you hear it, but it doesn't bring any kind of cognizance with it. And uh, by the time, I think that's what happens to the word pretty as the time she, by the time she gets to the end of this poem, it has no meaning anymore. And and it's the same conflict that's in the Anne Bradford Street poem, and it's still with us. Uh -huh. You know, how, how can you say, I love the life force? When the life force is killing everybody, you know, everything is killing each other. We're all, you know, everything, you know, Darwin has that statement. It's in the, it's an, an epigraph in the beginning of uh, Cold Mountain. You know, how, how beautiful, something about how beautiful the, the calm field is when all the war is going on there. There's pure war going on. 
<laughs> you know, between all the life forces in that field. So that's the same, and the, you know, that's, I think it's the same conflict that she's kind of playing with here. And I, you know, I, I, I don't think that playfulness, which may be called silliness, is it's the essence of poetry. You're playing around with these words and the, with these conflicts that are so crucial to us. And we have this kind of clumsy language to try to deal with it. And every time we try to say something, it contradicts itself or it turns out to be a puzzle or a conundrum. And, mm -hmm. and part of poetry is trying to, you know, do something different with the language so that the, that's a, that a, maybe a little ray of insight can enter. And uh, I think that this was, I think that's what she's doing with this poem. She's saying, wait, pretty, no, prettier, prettiest. But don't you think it's also, remember those people in the last poem we read, the ones who, who were waving from the beach and saying, oh, poor chap, he always loved larking and now he's dead. Like, you know, those, those well, shallow, awful people. I kind of imagine that those shallow, awful people are the speaker of this poem, you know, mm -hmm. who walk out into nature, which is so complicated and so yeah. full of death. And all they can say is, isn't it pretty? And But their psychology gets more complicated as it goes along because they start by saying, isn't it pretty? Isn't it pretty? As if, you know, because they don't want to think about what it really is. <laughs> you know, No, no which, how can you? How can you? Right. So they keep on saying that until they're completely overwhelmed. You know, the part, thing that's in their mind that realizes what's really happening here <laughs> lifts them upside down at that point where it shifts and they say, you know, they're feeling totally full of vertigo. The whole landscape has shifted, but they're still saying it's pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty because they don't know what else to say. That's and then right. at the end, Stevie Smith seems to say, you know, what else can you say? Yeah. So you might as well just keep saying pretty, 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 yeah, yeah, right. until you've delivered entirely from humanity. It is the interesting <laughs> thing about her, though, is that it's unclear whether she is the person speaking or it's, and she is being sort of daft, or she's yeah. being very clever, and the other people are being daft, and she's attributing it to them. I mean, when Kevin's talking, there's this sort of back and forth that Stevie's the speaker, or it's these daft people who want to make nature pretty. And I can't sort out who's who sometimes. I don't know whether she's being very clever and I'm laughing with her or she's being a little bit the thing that she's making fun of. I don't know that she's saying, I don't know that she's laughing at people who say things are pretty in nature. I think she's, she's struck with this conflict of, <laughs> You know, it's it's really so simple to, on the surface. Do you want the owl to get the baby rabbit, or don't you want the owl to get the baby rabbit? Uh, the owl will die if he doesn't get the baby rabbit. You know, where where's your where's your heart in this? <laughs> where's your heart in this struggle? And I think she, if she's talking to anybody, she's talking to herself. Mm hmm. Yeah, but I think it's a sort of, I mean, I don't think she's making fun of people either. I think there's a sort of psychological richness to this that says this is a human way of responding to something that a human being can't get her mind around entirely. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Like, like with the Bradstreet poem, she can't get her mind around the mysterious yeah. that would do this. So she has a human reaction to it. And, and the human reaction isn't necessarily rational. But it's helpful. <laughs> yeah, that no, you have to do. It's you know, you have to flail your arms when you're drowning. <laughs> you know, uh, and it doesn't mean you're waving and happy. It means this. Is, I've got to do this to try to survive somehow. You right. Know? And when Dom says he feels like she doesn't like him, I understand why one would feel that way because she seems to be pointing up our sort of cognitive shortcomings or something. <laughs> You know, like yeah. this is something we can't deal with. So I'm gonna, we're gonna treat it in a kind of witty way. But I, I also feel like she's pointing. I, I, she's she's thinking in a larger way than that. Uh, I think uh, I think so. And you know, if someone is happy <laughs> saying that's pretty, go ahead and do it. You know, I I, I gotta destroy it. I don't want to destroy it, but. Uh, I don't know if we're blessed or cursed 
to see the field as a where a, a terrible war is going on is that is that a blessing or a curse i don't know, I don't know. You know I, it, 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 next to that uh, you know i've got i've got the, the the collected poems but you know the poem next to that is piggy to joey mm -hmm. uh which is uh, eight lines piggy to joe piggy to joey piggy to joe Yes, that's what I was. Picky to Joe. Will he come back again? Oh, no, no, no. Oh, how I wish I hadn't been Piggy to Joe. And then the next poem is Pretty, which is this other uh, much, much more philosophical, uh, uh, deeper poem, but also filled with that undercurrent of uh, anger. And, and and aggression towards the, 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 that's restrained, but I mean it, it's there. It's, you know, it's rats and owls and people being eaten and and people drowning and people being mean to one another and trying to be polite about it. Uh, and that it, you know that it, at any given time, anything you know, the the thief is pretty. Uh, words are pretty things don't seem to have as much meaning to her and 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 i think that is is also one of the larger senses not trying to figure out the the larger meaning but that things don't have meaning mm -hmm. that you, not that you can have faith that god somehow has a greater hand but that yeah. everything kind of falls apart there you know that, that any anything can be I don't know. I mean, that, that makes her sound very modernist. Uh, but I, I think, you know, we're all dealing, every poet is dealing with, you know, the awful world and loss and death and, and aggression and, and all of this. And I, I, I think her, her balance is, is very attractive because she's, she's not rejecting it. And she's not afraid of it or making it more than it is. Uh, she's kind of treating it like an alien would treat it and say, you know, well, there it is. That's very interesting, isn't it? Uh, so, you know, I, I don't, I don't find here that there's a refusal or or an anguish. And when you're reading Bradstreet, uh, you know, an elegy uh, and, and dealing with with the hardness of of her life, she seems to accept it and. And, and and deal with it in a way that's not just Christian acceptance. It's it's almost like, wow, look at that, you know, life is this. And I, I see the same thing in Stevie Smith. It's very, uh, you know, yes we're yes we're drowning, but we're also waving. Wow, I don't see it that way at all. That's funny. Uh -huh. I kind of I I see in this poem a real desperation <laughs> and despair. And the more she repeats pretty, the more desperate it seems to me. But, um, I don't know. This, with, by the time the eye is opening up, and 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 you know, we're getting towards the end, there's just all kinds of of acrobatics going on. It's, it seems delightful. Wow. Really? Huh. Yeah, we've both this one. <laughs> huh? We have totally different experiences of this poem. That's interesting. D d delightful. Delightful in what way? Delightful in a poetic way, or delightful that she's expressing? a feeling of delight. It's what she's doing with it. She's not writing a poem, uh, she's not Edgar Allan Poe, and she's not, uh, you know, Ezra Pound, and she's not, uh, you know, there are so many different ways that you could deal with this experience. That's what makes all, all poets different from each other. But hers is, she's almost dancing with it. She's saying, oh look, here's this fear and this, and, and this difficulty in this, in this world, but look how we're playing with it. And that in itself is pretty. I don't mean I'm not reducing the, her meaning of the word pretty to to its surface meaning. I'm just saying that she comes back to it by the end of it. She's created something pretty out of this whole journey. <laughs> That's interesting. I think I think she's. I don't know what she's. Saying. I mean, you'd have to read it over and over. That's the reason it's a, a poem that can be read over and over. It's not that it's it's uh, uh, undecipherable, 
but that it's, you're drawn back to it because you know it is decipherable or it is touching something. But I think she's, maybe she's saying at the end, to, to be delivered entirely from humanity is not to try to make a judgment about it. Not to try to say it's not pretty, it's pretty, it's not pretty. Uh, you know, it's it's what it is and that's what that that's what you have to accept. I, I almost feel like she's gotten herself into a kind of a manic state of mind by the end of that poem. And she's hypnotized herself and um, I think she's finally sort of succumbing to that at the end and I love that because I feel like we're not just reading something we can parse out but we're reading a state of mind that is enacting itself into a new place yeah I think I had to paraphrase that and I love that about the poem yeah uh, well I do too I like that too uh, Leslie and I like the fact that that I feel she's think thought that this the writing of this poem has been the process of her thinking through this whole situation again and I think it really it I probably I think it probably actually started with that the poem began with that first question <laughs> well, why is the word pretty so underrated yeah and then she's saying well why is that you know why is there you know why <laughs> and then she, the poem is her trying to answer that question and and take and go with it wherever it goes you know as she thinks it as she writes and as she rewrites and I don't know. We were just doing this um, this uh, Tony Hoagland and Roberto Tejada and Martha Serpice and I were just doing this debate um, sort of public debate thing uh, about how poem was called how poems feel. It's this thing we do every year we do a big public debate and um, and one of the ways that I was thinking that poems express feeling, and, and somebody said that this poem was sort of felt modernistic, which I, I, I kind of agree with, that it, um, and that it's it's almost entirely interior, you know, or that mm -hmm. Patty and this thing like it's like listening in on the thoughts of a speaker, who begins with this sort of, you know, seemingly superficial musing, why is the word pretty so underrated, and then it the stakes just get higher and higher and higher the more we listen yeah. to our thoughts. But yeah. what she's thinking about is ultimately also a sort of unanswerable question, you know. The same one as yeah. like Anne Bradstreet's un unanswerable question is why does God do this, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, um, C.B. Smith's unanswerable question is, you know, why, why is nature, you know, how can nature be both pretty and also horrible? You know, horrible and suggesting of mortality and how, what, what, how can one respond to it? And then one responds to it, I think the way Leslie said by, you know, in this case, this speaker responds to it by going around and around in circles and becoming more and more manic. And, um, but I, you know, I was saying that one, one, in this thing, I was saying that one of the ways that feeling is expressed in poems is, is through ambivalence, a sort of emotional ambivalence. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean like a shrug, I mean like, uh, uh, emotion, you know, emotions that seem to go in divergent directions very strongly, simultaneously. Yeah. And, and here it's that manicness is one direction and that I think of as a really profound sadness is the other direction and a giddiness is maybe another direction. Um, I don't think we can ever say pretty is an underrated word anymore. <laughs> <laughs> after this poem. <laughs> and you, you know, I and and I I think it's a searching poem, and you know I I guess it was it wasn't it Rilke that said in the end you have to learn to love your questions. Yeah. Still, you know, we still want answers, but we have the internal eternal questions. It reminds me of your poem, Patty Ann, called "The Dead Don't Complain About Anything" or something like that. Is yeah. Yes. Oh, how nice, Kevin. Did you remember <laughs> that? <laughs> oh, I love that poem. Oh. It's right on my shelf. It's right there. <laughs> Funny. Um, well, anyway, that's right. Hey, the, the, oh, sorry. No, no go, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Well, now, I, you know, Kevin, I'm getting old and now I forgot what I was going to say. So. <laughs> 
<laughs> no one second, forgotten the next. Okay. <laughs> Whatever it was, I'm sure it was very pretty. <laughs> Thank you. After the use of this word in this poem. Okay. Do, do you want to try one more poem before we go? You can look at Our Bog is Dude. That's a great poem. Yeah, I just thought that. Uh, she loves language. You certainly can tell that. Yeah. I remember in grad school I brought Stevie Smith in for a class and um, because I thought she was so great. And my teacher was Carl Phillips who who said, okay, now that you brought this po poet in, now you have to explain to us why she's so great. And I utterly failed at it. I mean, I think I didn't have the vocabulary <laughs> or something. <laughs> it it, it oh. was one of the questions I, I wanted to ask you was, you know, it, it, as an editor, yeah, if you received five or six Stevie Smith poems, what would you do with them? I had a guy that grabbed them immediately and asked for more. What? What would I, you do? Oh my God! Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. I, I had a little Stevie Smith like po poet who used to I used to publish all the time. Who? who um, out, never out of sentimentality? Or, huh? Out of sentimentality or or. No, because I was. She was doing the same sort of thing, writing these crazy, these sort of wild things that seemed on the surface to be like nursery rhymes. Looking at my bookshelf, just looking for a copy of one of her poems, um, and you know. But underneath, there was such a sort of complicated emotional um, pattern, <laughs> or, or, or sort of fabric happening. And uh, I just think it's a really interesting trick. But I love it when a poem can appear to say one thing in that sort of nursery rhyme, pretty, pretty, pretty way, and really be saying something so completely different. I have that experience of Stevie Smith of sometimes reading one of her poems, it feels a little bit like I just got stabbed, but I didn't realize I was bleeding for about 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Felt good. <laughs> yeah, it didn't feel bad until I realized there was all this blood on it. Then it didn't feel good. <laughs> and, and, and you accused me of thinking I did she didn't like me? Yes. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Let's, well, let's let's we have we have a, a little time. You want? Do you want to put in our mug as dude? Do you, Do you want to read it or? Oh, sure. I'll read it. Am I supposed to? Is that what you're asking? Or yeah, I don't know what put in means. Um, our bog is dude. Our bog is dude. Our bog is dude. They lisp in accents mild, but when I asked them to explain, they grew a little wild. How do you know your bog is dude, my darling little child? Do you want to try we, to get in? Or? We know because we wish it so. This is enough, they cried. And straight within each infant eye stood up the flame of pride, and if you do not think it so, you shall be crucified. Then tell me, darlings, little ones, what's dude suppose bog is? Just what we think, the answer came, just what we think it is. They bowed their heads, our bog is ours, and we are wholly his. But when they raised them up again, they had forgotten me. Each one upon each other glared in pride and misery. For what was dude and what their bog, they never could agree. Oh, sweet it was to leave them then, and sweeter not to see, and sweetest of all to walk alone beside the encroaching sea, the sea that soon should drown them all, that never yet drowned me. <laughs> that is so good. Nasty little poem. I, no, yeah, no, you know. I, can I uh, uh, interrupt here just a minute? Because my husband has to has another go to meeting, and we are on the same internet connection. Oh. Does anybody here have enough tech advice to know if he can get on his go to meeting? While I'm on this one, At Patty and I, I can say this honestly: we're here tonight because no one here had enough tech advice last week to get us off. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> I know, <laughs> I knew it was a foolish question, yeah. but just hopefully. But it, 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 it's it's kind when John would ask me any kind of technological question. That's, that's, <laughs> Maybe we get to go to his meeting too. <laughs> yeah, let's, we'll, get, we'll just keep going on. They need a poll. Uh, listen, I, I may have to kind of duck out, and I really enjoyed this, and Kevin, you're great, and I 
I'm very proud of you. You're a professor, and I know <laughs> I had something to do with that. <laughs> and very, very well known and well published. Anyway, I wish we had. I think, Dom, you're going to have to give us an hour and a half or something rather than this hour. It's too short. That's probably the nicest thing you've ever said to me, Pat. Thank you. No, I'll, I'll, work, no. I'll, I'll work on that. I'll okay, go ahead. Talk, Patty Ann. <laughs> go ahead and discuss our bog is dude. I love it. <laughs> okay. And if, if I'll duck out with and not say anything more. It was good to hear you, Patty Ann. That's always nice to be with you. Well, I do have to say I, I'm grateful that you had tech problems or I would have missed this because I couldn't have done it last week. So anyway, go ahead. I don't want to take up any more time with this. It was the work of Bog. <laughs> it was the work of Bog. <laughs> <laughs> go I ahead. It's really confusing. The more I read it, the more wonderfully confused I get about what it's trying to say. Oh, I keep changing my mind. I love that. Oh, where, where is your mind at the moment? Um, well, what, what I, what I, she's sort of making fun of those people, uh -huh. but then she's really needing to get away from them. And I, I thought at first they were children and they were innocent, but then I'm beginning to think they're not so innocent, they're misguided, and she is really glad to just ditch them. Yeah, when I, well, the first time I read it, that's where I was too, and then... You know, and it seems, I think, on the surface, I think this is another one of these ones with that sort of is polyvalent. Like, it seems on the surface as though she's making some statement about a kind of um, simple-headed um, orthodoxy, religious orthodoxy, right? Where we say, well, our bog is dude, and if you don't believe in our bog being dude, we're going to crucify you, so there. But, but what I found makes it more interesting than that since you know that's something I, I could do in a quick paragraph is that the speaker herself begins being in a kind of troubling way I mean from the beginning she's already really condescending <laughs> you know before they've even said anything to her she calls them my darling little child when as you say they're clearly not little children so it seems like a, a, a sort of mighty condescension and at the end she seems to me to be almost murderous I mean the, the, the rhythm of the final stanzas are is so sort of cheerful and upbeat and um, and nursery rhymey as what she's describing is you know something like the biblical flood <laughs> drowning everybody but it never yet drowned me you know and I don't know I find her to be in the end the almost the more troubling character um, and she calls it sweet which is another interesting thing because that's one of those other little words that's so diminutive in a way and she's turning it into something else yeah and and it's all it's also uh, vaguely uh, elusive to, to biblical lay language you know it's it's it, what it's it's sweet to believe it, it's it's sweet to see and believe but sweeter still to believe and not see or, or whichever yeah. that one it is and uh uh and that that same kind of uh uh, turn of the century, early twentieth century uh, religious poetry that, that 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 you would find. A little child, come with me. And uh, uh, was that the Thompson poet uh, poem, uh, "The Hound of Heaven"? You know that that kind of uh, that kind of, that kind of vision of of, of God and Jesus taking you by the hand and 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 doing all these these peculiar things uh, <laughs> bringing you to salvation and, you know and, and of course the ironic part of it is that you know the first poem we did was she was the drowning the drowning not waving and now she's drowning everyone I, I don't think that would, would have been completely unconscious mm -hmm. no I mean I, I, when I think I mean I, we're sort of out of time, and I'm, we're just beginning this, but I think of it as a, about two kinds of dangerousness, and one is the sort of easy dangerousness of, you know, of hypocritical or, or a sort of blind orthodoxy, you know, yeah. cru uh, us crucifying each other. But the other one is about a sort of middle-class smugness, um, and a, a middle-class smugness, I don't know if I'm calling it, well, because she's always 
you know, that kind of a smugness that allows you to condescend to people and ultimately, you know, to, to appear to be both sort of gleeful and murderous. Like, we could just wipe all these people off the planet and we'd be better off. It's not going to get me. Um, but the irony at the end is that it has already sort of gotten her because she's already as cruel as they are. I mean, that, that, that's how I kind of read that final line. But she also, but she put it there. Yeah, she did. Yeah, but not, I mean, it wasn't like it slipped out of her. She, you know, it's, it's one of those things that say, if, if, if you were writing a poem and you and you were, your last two lines were, uh, I'm going to drown everyone in the world, you would be very, very yeah. aware of, of sometimes, that. Sometimes and, a speaker in a poem reveals more about herself than she, she meant to. I don't mean Stevie Smith, I mean the speaker of the poem. Sure. I, I think the vulnerability that, that I felt so much in the first poem sort of informs the way I read everything else, that all the bite and fire behind what she's saying is coming from a kind of pain and vulnerability. She's, she's trying to make her way as well. And even though she's smarter than almost everybody else, she's not, she's not superior to them in her own mind. She's, she's flailing. Yeah. I don't know about whether she's smarter or not, even that's the issue. I guess I'm a little confused about how we're talking about it because there's not an orthodoxy because the two characters, the children, can't agree with one another, which is what starts the fight to begin with. All they know is that they're in charge and they have power, and they're going to use their power over her and perhaps crucify her, which I think throws us into the religious conversation that is available but not necessarily necessary. Where at the end, how many different... Uh, scenarios can we imagine where there's these children or people of any sort who have power want to exhibit over you and if you don't go along with the power that they want to perpetrate then they're going to threaten you and at the end i'm pretty happy that they might drown and that she's not going to drown and she's going to be free i mean if it's the 70s or the 80s and we're not as quite as uh, social media oriented or quite sort of institutionalized like maybe we see the speaker as a hero who's uh, staying away from the institutional horror that uh, the, these children are affording. I don't know. I think, I think she's participating in it, but... Where? It, it, it also has that, that same sort of obsessive silliness with that that had we had with the pretty poem, where you just keep saying a, a, a word that has no meaning, and then we fill in, you know, fill in whatever meaning we want it to more or less have, so this time we just have dude, uh, dude, and 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 bog, which we we can sort of come to as words and guess at, but never, com you know, completely defined. They're they're just kind of connotated words with no real denotations. Well, they nudge up against our God is dead a little bit, don't they? Yeah. What with the crucifixion? Or, or our God is good. Or our God is good. Yes. Yeah. It's, yeah. To say. I think her smartness may be just that of really clear observation. And that line, um, I was too far out, I was much too far out all my life. It's almost like she, I, I guess I'm really maybe running too uh, very far with that line. Um, because I like the idea that maybe she felt herself to be an outsider and that gave her this incredible observational sharpness. And that's what I meant by being smart when I made that remark earlier. Yeah, that's a great thing to observe. Um, well, it's it's getting to be. It's time. Yeah, uh, that's a it, nice way to close it. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. We, Kevin, we, we we thank you. We we encourage everyone to uh, to purchase your book, Churches. Oh. Everything's available on on Amazon now. It's a, our own blog. Uh, <laughs> and. Uh, Thank you again. Thank uh, thank all our participants this evening. Uh, next month, it's uh, we're doing the first uh, chapter of Robert Duncan. Oh, cool! So we we'll look forward to seeing all of you then. And then I hope in a couple all of your weeks, bogs are dude. excuse me. I said I hope all of your bogs are dude. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Good night on that. <laughs> good night. Okay. Good night.